Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches The Great Gatsby. In this video, we're going to be taking an in-depth look at chapter seven, but only the first half to two thirds. It's an analysis video rather than a reading video. So we're gonna be focusing on theme and character. It is a whopping chapter because this is the moment of massive confrontation, which is why it needs to be split out into two videos. If you haven't already read chapter seven, please do so before you watch this video because it is full of spoilers. And if you want any help, do go and have a little look at my audiobook playlist where you will find a reading of chapter seven. But for now, let's get started with our analysis. So we'll do a plot summary of the whole of the chapter just so we know where we're going. Now the chapter does not open with a big world party, in fact it opens with the opposite, a recognition that all of the parties are gone and no one is rocking up to Gatsby's house for momentous amounts of booze anymore. He's even got rid of all of his servants, he's replaced them with a bunch of people that clearly work for Wolfsheim. Uh, for the kind of guarded reason that he needs people that can be discreet when he and Daisy are around. So Gatsby actually calls up Nick at the beginning of this um, and says that Daisy would like him to come to lunch. So Gatsby's inviting Nick round. Now, what an awkward lunch because we are going to have Tom Buchanan and Daisy and we're going to have Nick and Jordan. Oh, yeah. And we're going to have Gatsby all sat round at the same dinner table. And it is as awkward as you can imagine, because this is Gatsby's opportunity to get Daisy to tell Tom that she never loved him, which is the one thing that he needs her to do. The lunch is incredibly awkward. We meet their daughter. Gatsby meets their daughter, which is a bit of a shock to the system. And Daisy inadvertently spills the beans over lunch and tells uh, or shows Tom, I should say, that she actually is in love with Gatsby. Tom obviously has to desperately take um, charge of this situation. And so there is a frantic decision for them all to go into town. Change of scenery, it's all about Tom getting control. But what does happen is Tom and Jordan and Nick stop together. They're driving Gatsby's car, another little power play of, uh, of Tom's where he tries to get control of Gatsby's car, but Gatsby ends up going off with Daisy in their car. So Tom, Nick and Jordan are all in Gatsby's car and they rock up to the garage where Myrtle is and Myrtle sees them from the top window and looking down all she sees is, is a yellow car with Tom and a woman who she of course assumes is Daisy so for her this is like oh you're there with your wife at my house in the meantime Tom discovers from Wilson that Wilson's found out that Myrtle's been having an affair he doesn't know that it's Tom he just knows that it's happened so he wants to get um, Myrtle away and there's this little moment where they Tom sort of realizes that he is losing both his wife and his mistress so what is the solution to that charge ahead win beat Gatsby in a driving race get themselves into the center um, which is what he tries to do that's what he's trying to keep control they all end up at the plaza which is a fancy swish hotel um, desperately kind of seeking out some cool temperatures um, and actually it is at the plaza where the massive confrontation occurs not only does the confrontation begin between Tom and Gatsby in relation to his relationship with his wife but Tom also reveals that he knows everything about Gatsby's business his criminality his bootlegging his vague and ambiguous dealings with betting with Wolfsheim it turns out that one of Tom's acquaintances has been mixed up in all of this Tom calls out Gatsby for everything and whilst this is happening despite the fact that Gatsby has got Daisy to say reluctantly I never loved you this is the moment where he begins to lose her properly because she understands that he is not the man that she thought he was. And so despite everything, she becomes um, more willing to kind of stay with Tom, less willing to be with Gatsby. And this horrible moment of confrontation ends with 
Tom telling her to drive on home with Gatsby because he's not going to be bothering her anymore. It's a real power play. And it again leaves Tom, Nick and Jordan packing up the scene as, at the plaza while Daisy and Gatsby um, disappear off. Um, then there is this sudden shift where we get the um, a, a narrative from the perspective of a young Greek guy called Michaelis, who works in the Valley of Ashes, who basically starts giving an account of what happened. But we're not told what happened until a page or so later where we discover through the voice of Michaelis that at some point in this evening, um, having had a massive row with with Wilson, Myrtle comes running out onto the street and is hit and instantly killed um, by a car. Um, Tom and Nick and Jordan stop at the scene in that kind of morbid curiosity way. And then, of course, Tom realises that it is Myrtle that is dead and is lying out her dead body on one of the workshop tops like she's just nothing more than a broken down car. You actually get a little bit of emotion from Tom in this case. It turns out that it was a yellow car um, that hit Daisy for a second. Wilson starts thinking that it's Tom because, of course, the last time he saw that yellow car, Tom was driving it. But Tom is able to put his mind at rest and say, no, 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 it wasn't me. Look, I came in that car. I was in that blue coupe. I, that wasn't me. Um, and Tom is incredibly emotional and comes to the conclusion that, of course, Gatsby has hit Myrtle. Um, and he is he is most, most aggrieved, most upset. They all arrive back to um, uh Tom's house, sorry, Jordan, Nick and Tom arrive back at Tom's house. Daisy's already there. Um, Tom offers Nick to go inside. Nick says no. He's very, very cold and aloof with Jordan, basically doesn't want anything. He's quite sort of standoffish. And Jordan's like, oh, right. OK, just seen a woman die, but you're not even going to. OK, fine, whatever. So she goes off into the house and um, Nick finds Gatsby and Gatsby is outside reveals to Nick, although he tries to hide it, that it wasn't actually him driving the car. It was, in fact, Daisy driving the car. And Gatsby is planning on protecting Daisy and saying that it was him all along. And he was just sort of hoping that nobody saw him, which is, of course, not the case. You get this real sense that Gatsby is still kind of living in hope. He's told Daisy that if if um, Tom tries any funny business that she's to flicker on the lights on and off um, so that he can come in and protect her. So he's still like living this dream that all will be well and they'll be OK. And Nick for a second is like, oh, well, yeah, actually, that's a possibility. So he's like, oh, I'll nip around the corner and I'll, I'll go and see if I can see anything. And what he actually sees is the two of them sort of like silhouetted by the window and they're they've got a couple of bottles of beer or ale and they've got some fried chicken in between them and they're kind of leaning over and it is such a kind of image of the two of them together that it is very clear that it is the two of them together and it is Gatsby alone yeah that Gatsby's on the other side and Nick basically leaves Gatsby there looking over nothing it's a very 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 depressing chapter and as you can see a lot happens which is why I'm kind of breaking this down into two parts Let's start off back at the beginning of the chapter and let's talk about setting. Key word for you here, pathetic fallacy. That is where the uh, the weather is really representative or mimetic of the kind of tone, the mood and the characters. And guess what, guys? It is roasting hot. Um, I don't think you can get symbolism more straightforward than that. Uh, look at some of the vocab choices here to describe this weather. The next day is broiling. Yeah, um, certainly the warmest. We have the hot whistles. We have a simmering hush. We're on the edge of combustion. We've got this sweating woman and this very strange, ambiguous moment where she drops her pad and Nick picks it up and it's all kind of awkward and difficult and you've got the, again this almost 
incongruous moment with the conductor who was shouting some weather hot 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 and it's all very almost like delirious and feverous and chaotic and mad and this is all about the rising rising tension the fact that this love story this love story has been building over the heat of summer and now we are at the moment of tension the highest tension in the whole novel and it is literally at boiling point. It is like the whole thing is a volcano about to erupt. So that's where we begin. This is their kind of description en route to uh, Daisy and Tom Pass. Now, there's all sorts that we could talk about about this dinner. But the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we meet Pammy. Daisy's child. Now, she's only been mentioned very, very briefly before, and it's so important structurally and to the whole storyline that she is brought in here because Daisy's daughter is a symbol of the relationship that she has with Tom. And this chapter is all about whether or not Daisy can say, I never loved you to Tom. Gatsby wants her to obliterate their life. But what she has here is a an, an never-ending, everlasting reminder that, of course, she does and did love Tom and that their life and relationship cannot be obliterated. This is all about foreshadowing the, well, the end, because it's just not feasible what Gatsby is asking. Now, look at the way that Daisy tries to manipulate the situation. OK, so this is all about showing off her daughter. Yeah. So, you know, the blessed, precious sounds a little bit like Gollum. I don't think that was Fitzgerald's intention. Um, look at this, how she treats her like a little doll. That's because your mother wanted to show you off. But here you dream you. You absolute little dream. So symbolic, because again, it's a reminder that children are often considered to be the dreams of their parents. You know, their parents live vicariously through their children. And this is a product of Daisy and Tom. And using those words dream, it's so ironic, it's so bitter, because, of course, what we're seeing through Pammy is the obliteration of Gatsby's dream. Now, Daisy, this is obviously, this is obviously Daisy trying to kind of show Gatsby off to Pammy as well, because Daisy is thinking about her future and she needs a future where Gatsby can also love her child. How do you like mother's friends? Do you think they're pretty? <laughs> Where's daddy? Well done, Pammy. <laughs> Straight in there with the wrong thing to say. Uh, but Daisy is trying to kind of fashion a narrative that makes sense for their future, pointing out that she doesn't look like her father. She looks like me. She's got my hair and shape of face. It's all about showing that the, the future can be sort of rewritten as well. Like Tom can be written out of it. So it's like Gatsby is trying to live in the past and Daisy's trying to kind of establish a narrative for the future that works. But if you look at Gatsby's reaction. Look here, I've popped it in bold. Gatsby and I in turn leaned down and took the small reluctant hand. Afterwards, he kept looking at the child with surprise. I don't think he had ever really believed in its existence before. Of course he didn't. Of course he couldn't believe in its existence because it doesn't work with his narrative, with his storyline of he and Daisy as the greatest love of all. You can't have a child with another man whilst never having loved another man. So this moment is a real, uh, 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 it's not going to work. And on that note, let's look at the way that the revelation takes place. So this is still in their house. Remember, hot day, hot, 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 everything hot and horrifying, hot, hot, hot. Daisy says, who wants to go to town? Yeah, restless and looking for something. Gatsby's eyes floated towards her. Ah, she cried, you look so cool. OK, you look so cool, meaning you look attractive, you know, you look really together, but it's also you look so cool. It's like a tonic to the heat. She's hot. She's 
struggling, yet he is cool. He's like an oasis. He's like something to escape into. And then the death blow. You always look so cool. It's that little adverb. It's like you are always the person to make me feel better. You are always the thing that I can escape to. And look at the kind of romance in this moment. They stare together at each other, alone in space. She had told him that she loved him and Tom Buchanan saw. So it doesn't matter that she didn't say, Gatsby and I love each other, Tom. It's this moment of, of like such togetherness and such intimacy across this crowded table that Tom sees and that is enough. That is enough to shake him. Now she moves on, kind of trying to make it better, I suppose, or maybe oblivious. You resemble the advertisement of the man. You know the advertisement of the man. Now, this is so fitting um, because, of course, that's exactly what Gatsby is. He's an advertisement of man. It's like this falsity. It's about he he has presented this, this version of himself, which is all about looking how he thinks people want him to look, people being Daisy. So she's really actually hit on it. In one moment, she's showing that she loves him. But in the next moment, she's also showing very ironically that she doesn't really even know who he is because he is nothing more than an advertisement for a man. Now, not wanting to completely and utterly like tear apart the beauty of their love or anything, but I'm gonna. Sorry. As they are getting ready to leave the house, this is what happens. Gatsby's in a bit of a mess. He turns to Nick rigidly. I can't say anything in his household sport. She's got an indiscreet voice, I remarked. It's full of, I hesitated. So this is Nick talking about the whole, you're so cool, you're always so cool. Like, whoopsie, that was a bit indiscreet. But look at how Gatsby finishes his thought. Her voice is full of money, he said suddenly. Now, I'm hoping your brains are all going because let's think, what has Daisy been like described as in the past? Everything about her, it all comes down to her voice. Oh, her voice is so melodious. Oh, her voice, you know, draws you in. And there is a moment earlier on where Nick is talking about whether or not Daisy could ever possibly live up to Gatsby's dream of her. And his assumption or his realisation is no, with one exception, her voice. Her voice, according to Nick in that chapter, is like a deathless song. Yeah, this beautiful, oh, it's the, it's the very part of her. It's her very being. It's her essence. All the, oh, actually, what is it? It's full of money. Money. And Nick understands it in this moment. Look at that declarative. That was it. I'd never understood it before. It was full of money, i.e., the most attractive, the most everlastingly attractive thing about Daisy, even to Gatsby, is nothing more than her money. He might be in love with her for all sorts of reasons, but what is the driving force? What is the thing that never goes away? Her money. And look at the way Fitzgerald, sorry, I'm getting really irate. <laughs> uh, look at the way that Fitzgerald describes the money. Look at his choices. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it. That metaphor of the melody of her voice is nothing but the jingle of coins, the jingle of it, lovely onomatopoeia, the symbols song of it. Notice again that sibilant sound there again. It's so phonetically representative of money and coins and rustling cash. And then you get the allusion to King Midas again, all the way back from chapter one. High in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl, King Midas, who touched whenever he touched anything, it turned to gold. So Daisy is nothing more than a statue, a gold statue that cannot love or be loved because all she is is money. So although we might hear be going, oh, Gatsby and his love for Daisy, what motivates that love? I'm going to say it one more time. It's money. And onto other people we don't like. So this is a real chapter for look how horrible everyone is. <coughs> right, Tom Buchanan. He is so threatened 
quite rightly, because his wife is having an affair with the man that she's brought for lunch. But, you know, kettle, pot and all of that. Um, let's start looking at some of the digs and some of the power challenges and the dynamic between him and Gatsby in this chapter. Uh, one of the first things. I don't see the idea of going to town, broke out Tom savagely. Women get these notions in their heads. This is very similar to something that he said previously to Nick about Gatsby being a funny fish and Daisy getting these notions. So he's, he says this to Gatsby in this case. It's very much pointing out that Gatsby is a passing thing. She's just a notion. Um, now, as... Um, this is, again, such a massive power play here. This is as they're getting ready to go to the plaza and they're talking about whether or not Gatsby's car um, has enough gas in it because Tom has decided that he is going to drive Gatsby's car. What a metaphor. Um, and his plan is to take Daisy in it. Plenty of gas, said Tom boisterously. He looked at the gauge. If it runs out, I can stop at a drugstore. You can buy anything at a drugstore nowadays. Ooh, another pop at uh, Gatsby there. He's trying to make him feel uneasy. He's showing him that he knows about his history and his past and how he got his money. Because guess what, guys? In the Prohibition, when people wanted booze, guess where you got it? You got it from the drugstore. That's where the illegal bootlegging sales were going on because the drugstores were the one place you could get a prescription for whiskey, believe it or not. So there was a lot of over-the-counter naughtiness with booze. So a pause followed this apparently pointless remark. Of course, it's not pointless. That's why you've got apparently. Um, there is an adverb um, because it is very pointed. But look at the reaction that Gatsby has. An indefinable expression. Definitely unfamiliar, vaguely recognisable, passed over Gatsby's face. Something that he had only described in words. Is it fear or is it feeling murderous? And Tom has one final put down there. I'll take you in this circus wagon. Lovely little metaphor to kind of point out the the gaudiness and the brashness of new money Gatsby you know he's hitting him where it hurts this is in the car Tom Jordan and Nick Jordan's giving him a bit of a tell-off for being a snob about Gatsby uh, and Tom reveals that he's done some investigating and this is about Oxford he goes an Oxford man who's incredulous like hell he is he wears a pink suit yeah he's obviously from Oxford New Mexico so it's about his gaudiness again. It's not just a circus wagon car. He dares to wear a pink suit. No Oxford man would wear a pink suit because obviously the British are known for being very reserved and well to do, particularly in the 1920s. So again, it's all about his suspicion, um, insulting his heritage. Now, when they stop at the drugstore, because they do indeed stop to get petrol and... Um, we see George Wilson. What we actually discover is that Wilson is in pieces. Wilson is sick. He is green in the face. And what has made him sick is the realisation that Myrtle has cheated on him, that Myrtle has been having an affair. And his response to this is to try and get Myrtle away. But what Nick observes is the parallel between Wilson and Tom. They have both found out that their wives have been having affairs. And it occurs to him that there's no difference between men in intelligence or race so profound as the difference between the sick and the well. Wilson was so sick that he looked guilty, unforgivably guilty, as if he had just got some poor girl with child. Okay, so Wilson's response to finding out that Myrtle has cheated is guilt. Because he thinks, what did I do? Why did she look elsewhere? What could I have done differently? What Tom sees? Competition. I'm going to tear you down. But what is interesting is the reaction. He says, I'll let you have that car. I'll send it over tomorrow afternoon. Now, I will do a whole other video on the whole Tom and Myrtle relationship at another time. But this is key because um, relationships are 
often symbolized through the kind of motif of the car. And actually, Tom and Myrtle's whole relationship has been working on the basis that Tom is going to sell a car to Wilson. And that's how they've gotten away with it. That's how the phone calls happen. And that's how they stay in one another's lives. And in this moment where Tom says, I'll let you have that car, it's literally like Tom relinquishing his hold on Myrtle. It's like saying, I'll give you back your wife. I'll let you have this one. Yeah, so he is literally relinquishing in this moment. Is it guilt? Is it guilt because he has a, oh, what, you know, this has happened to Wilson, what's happening to me and look, he's sick. Maybe, maybe it is guilt. Maybe it's just getting a bit too complicated. But the most important thing to remember is that Tom has relinquished um, uh, Myrtle and has handed her back in the form of a car to her husband without any say, discussion, without any voice of Myrtle. It's another transaction. She has been given back, which is really representative of their whole relationship. She's been something for him to use the entire time. And whilst this is going on, this discussion with Wilson, which is one of the things that's getting Tom all kind of like, Arr. the coupe is flashed by with a flurry of dust and the flash of a waving hand. I bye, Tom, starting my new life. So this kind of race of the car becomes a kind of representation of the race for Daisy. Um, and actually, Nick observes, as they do finally drive away, that Tom is feeling the hot whips of panic. Oh, what a wonderful metaphor. Um, torturous and painful and desperate, lovely, plosive p sound repeated there. The hot whips of panic in that consonance. His wife and his mistress, until an hour ago, secure and inviolate, were slipping precipitately from his control. Notice again, it's not, oh no, I'm losing the love of my life. It's, I no longer control this situation. Um, and he likes to imagine both his wife and his mistress uh, quite ironically as being secure and inviolate. Inviolate means free from violation. Oh yes, so very pure. <laughs> um, but it's again, it's about this idea of what he owns and what he possesses and who, what belongs to him. And that is what's disappearing. And that Tom Buchanan cannot cope with. Another little note on setting. This is us in the plaza. So we've still got the issue of heat, 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 heat. And it's, it's getting worse as the chapter progresses. And all of this, they're kind of joking in this really tense way. Daisy's like, open windows, get an axe if you can't open another window. They're talking about bathing in bars and drinking cocktails in the bath. And it's meant to be lighthearted, but it's not. And what makes it even worse is as we have this description of the heat making Tom impatient, um, large and stifling, um, is this growing tension between Gatsby and Tom. Tom calls him on this old sport business. But whilst all of this is happening, look what blasts out. As Tom took up the receiver, the compressed heat exploded into sound and we were listening to the portentous chords of Mendelssohn's wedding march from the ballroom below. How symbolic is that? Whilst one marriage is imploding upstairs, another marriage is beginning downstairs. You can look at this in so many different ways. You can look at this as the wedding is going on downstairs and, and relationship is beginning just as Gatsby hopes that his and Daisy's is beginning. You can look at the irony of the kind of sense of a doomed marriage. That's why it's portentous. You can even look at it as this being the re-marriage uh, of um, Tom and Daisy, which is, of course, where it ends up by the end of the chapter with the two of them united. But Fitzgerald is playing with us here with his symbolism. Who's Biloxi? What happened? We suddenly get into the story of um, Tom and Daisy's wedding, which is obviously going to be very difficult for Gatsby in the first place. But then we get onto this weird convo about this chap called Biloxi, who is clearly a fraud. 
And it's in this moment that everyone establishes that this bloke that went to Tom and Daisy's wedding and then subsequently stayed with Jordan for three weeks, lied to them all, telling each of them that he knew another one, told them that he was a president of Yale <coughs> at the university. Excuse me. <coughs> there he told me he was president of your class at Yale when there wasn't a president so this tiny seemingly incongruous storyline is there for one reason and one reason alone it triggers the conversation about Gatsby being a fraudster it's a parallel to Gatsby they're talking about a man pretending to be someone he isn't and using the people around him to do so look at the way that Gatsby responds Gatsby's foot beat a short restless tattoo like he sat there like, like tapping his foot uncomfortably because this is like a version of him being described and that's exactly what leads Tom to start this new line of questioning I understand you're an Oxford man. And then best insult ever. What a burn. You must have gone there about the time Biloxi went to New Haven. So in this moment, he's using the story of Biloxi and his falsity and the fact that he's a fraudster to point out that that is exactly what Gatsby is as well. Now, Gatsby wins this round because he's able to explain when he was at Oxford and everyone takes a sigh of relief and goes, oh, phew. You did go to Oxford. It's not a lie. Whew. But that's not the end of it. Now on to the hard stuff. This is the climax, I suppose, of this moment in the plaza where Gatsby finally gets Daisy to say the words. Um, but let's look at everyone's responses. So let's look at how Nick starts off about causing a row in his house. So Gatsby is content because it's finally out being spoken, but look at how uh, Tom insults Gatsby. I suppose the latest thing, so another version, like another reference to newness and fashion, which obviously he's very snooty about. I suppose the latest thing is to sit back and let Mr. Nobody from nowhere make love to your wife. So this is all about Gatsby's heritage or lack thereof. And this is the one thing that Tom cannot cope with. It's, it's bad enough that Daisy is having an affair, but to have an affair with Mr. Nowhere from nobody, or Mr. Nobody, sorry, from nowhere. Um, this is all about Gatsby's greatest insecurities. Tom has him to the letter here. Okay, Gatsby um, tells Tom that Daisy never loved him and hasn't loved him for five years. And there's a cruelty in Gatsby in this moment um, that helps us remember that he is not the great tragic love hero here. When Tom challenges, he says, not seeing, no, we couldn't meet, but both of us loved each other all that time, old sport, and you didn't know. I used to laugh sometimes, but there was no laughter in his eyes, to think that you didn't know. Not only is this incredibly cruel, the idea of Gatsby and Daisy cheating on him and laughing about it and note the cruelty there. There's no laughter in his eyes. He's deadly serious. But what's particularly interesting here is this is just not true. Gatsby is rewriting the narrative to suit his storyline, to suit this idea that Tom and Daisy have only ever loved each other. That, that um, Sorry, Gatsby and Daisy have only loved ever loved each other, that Tom is just something pointless, inconsequential, uh, to be kind of battered away. Um, a little bit on Tom's view of his relationship, you know, obviously he's not buying into this, he sees through it and he justifies his behaviours. Look again at the way that Gatsby is diminished into just a foolish idea in her head, so it's a repetition of the concept of the notion, the notion in her head, and she doesn't know what she's doing. Um, he talks about going off on a spree and making a fool of himself, but the fact that he always comes back. 
This metaphor going off on a spree is so horrible. And you can understand why Daisy says it's revolting. You know, think about a metaphor. It's like a, as, as a metaphor of like a shopping spree. Do you know what I mean? Where you just go off and you just buy, 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 buy. It's talking about having sex with other women. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful. But what he's trying to do here is he's basically sort of lay, laying his cards on the table and saying, look, I am flawed. But despite these flaws, I still love Daisy. Um, <clears throat> Gatsby is still clinging despite Tom's confidence. But look structurally at this sentence. This is to Daisy. He says, just tell him the truth that you never loved him and it's all wiped out forever. Look at what's in the parenthesis. So the, the hyphens create parenthesis here. Just tell him the truth and it's all wiped out forever. In parenthesis, he needs to remind her what the truth is. It's another sign of this being Gatsby's narrative. It's not Daisy's narrative. And in all of these parts of this chapter, as Gatsby and Tom are arguing back and forth about who Daisy loved, Daisy barely speaks. They both speak her narrative for her. Tom talks of her narrative of her love for him. Gatsby talks about her narrative of the way that she loved him and never loved Tom. And, and actually, Daisy has so little voice in this scene. And then eventually she breaks. You want too much, which was what Nick warned Gatsby of all along. I did love him once, but I loved you too. Gatsby's eyes open and closed. You loved me too? It's like total disbelief for Gatsby. This is almost a betrayal. This dream here is now just like slipping, slipping, slipping away because the notion that she could love him too goes against the big narrative of Gatsby and Daisy that she never loved anyone other than him, that her whole life has been a lie because Gatsby's the only one that has gone with that little word there, that little adverb there, too. I loved you too. Um, Tom draws upon something that is so true in this moment when he says, there are things between Daisy and me that you'll never know, things that neither of us can ever forget. Yeah, like that child. Another reminder of how unrealistic Gatsby's love for Daisy is and was. Um, you cannot just obliterate a past. And Tom is right in pointing it out. And that's why this metaphor is so powerful here about the words biting physically into Gatsby. This hurts him, literally hurts him, because it's a reminder of those things that he cannot change. And note the way that just like Tom, Fitzgerald shows to us just how controlling Gatsby is. He wants to speak to Daisy alone. He needs to reiterate that narrative. Look at the way that he talks about her. She's all excited now, like she's a little child. In this moment, Gatsby is no better than Tom. They're both controlling. They're both putting their narratives on Daisy and Daisy is just left floundering. But that's not enough. Tom still has one trick up his sleeve and that trick is the truth. That trick is reality, part of what has been fueling Gatsby's dream is the fact that no one knows he's been able to continue this idea of who he is and how he built up and how he got his money. And now here Tom is bearing his soul and what he's had to do. He's pointed him out as a bootlegger, just one of his little stunts. And then you get this reference to what is really clearly some very dodgy criminal behaviour with Wolfsheim, perhaps to do with betting laws, perhaps to do with money laundering. He talks about how he's, um, you know, ruined this guy, Walter, who was an associate of, of 
of Tom. So I think Gatsby in this moment thinks he's got him there. But actually, you know, the point that he's, you know, Gatsby tries to get him on class. He's like, oh, yeah, well, Walter didn't mind working with me. But that's not the point. Walter ended up in prison for a month because of Gatsby. Tom is bearing to Daisy or showing Daisy that Gatsby is not the man she thinks he is. She said earlier, you are like the advertisement of a man. Yeah, and what's behind that advertisement, the real Gatsby, is a criminal. Um, which is why Daisy starts drawing further and further into herself. Look at the way that Fitzgerald changes the narrative style here. So we've gone from all of this direct speech, we've gone from lots of dialogue, massive dialogue, heavy scene, because it's a confrontation. And now suddenly in this paragraph, the dialogue disappears and it's all in direct speech. It passed and he began to talk excitedly to Daisy, denying everything, defending his name against accusations that had not been made. But with, excuse me, with every word she was drawing further and further, he gave up and only that dead dream fought on as the afternoon slipped away. So it makes him sound desperate. And in some ways we're in indirect speech or reported speech because we don't need to know what he says because the dream is dead. He's lost. Tom's won. And the absolute sign of this of Tom having won so dramatically is where Daisy begs him to make it stop. And his solution is for her to drive home with Gatsby. You start on home, Daisy, said Tom, in Mr. Gatsby's car. Oh, power play. And then even worse, go on, he won't annoy you. I think he realises that his presumptuous little flirtation is over. What a dysphemistic way to sum up their relationship. Not only is it just a little flirtation, so completely diminishing the five-year love affair that that is Gatsby and Daisy in Gatsby's mind, it's now just a little flirtation. And check out this adjective. It's presumptuous because it's just another moment for Tom to point out to Gatsby that he is beneath Daisy. And now it's not just because he's new money, it's because he's a criminal. And it works. It absolutely works. But it's such a sign of Tom's absolute power and control and awareness that he has won here. Because literally to, to go from having been like, oh, what if they what if they duck behind a, a, a wall and never return? Oh, I can't bear them driving ahead of me. Now he's like, go on, go on drive home in Gatsby's car. He won't annoy you. Tom's won. Gatsby's lost. Now, just at the very end of this section, not chapter, because this is only like the first two thirds, we get this quite strange little moment uh, with Nick, um, where Tom is sort of, you know, Tom's victorious and he's packing up and he's offering drinks around. And Nick has this little moment where, yeah, he remembers that it's his birthday and that he's turning 30 with a portentous menacing road of a new decade ahead. Quite often when people read this, everyone goes, oh, wow, Fitzgerald. Yeah, he was obviously alluding to like the fact that the Wall Street crash happens in 1929 and the 1930s is a period of massive like depression. But no, because this was written in the early 20s. So actually, this is just Fitzgerald just having a really bleak outlook. But again, it's one of those moments where it's almost like you feel like Fitzgerald could see into the future because Nick views the future of him in his 30s in a kind of similar way to a lot of people would then look at the 1930s um, in America. But certainly it is a really bleak outlook. We have another reference to T.S. Eliot where he refers to proof of where he talks about the poem, sorry, where he talks about um, a thinning list of single men to know, a thinning briefcase of enthusiasm, thinning hair. Yeah, really, really kind of depressing version and view of himself. And the one thing that kind of perks him up is the idea of Jordan. And Jordan is a little tonic to him in this moment. And why is she a tonic to him? Because yes, that's right, Nick views her as a thoroughly two-dimensional, emotionless being who wouldn't possibly carry well-forgotten dreams from age to age. He's attracted to Jordan in this moment because he's like, she couldn't possibly have the same issues that Daisy has. She's not going to have some love affair from the past because she's just 
Jordan. Um, and so in this moment, he's like, oh, Jordan. Yes, my lovely, cold, emotionless girlfriend who I could never possibly hurt. And then the absolute stinker of a sentence. And so we drove on towards death through the cooling twilight. OK, obviously, we I've spoiled the end of the t this chapter. We know that we're this is foreshadowing of Myrtle's death. But when you read it first time round, if you didn't know that Myrtle was about to die, you can just see this as a metaphor for the bleakest kind of version of, of Nick's life ahead of him. Like, oh, we're all just moving forward towards death. And it's a kind of valley of the ashes kind of feel, which is appropriate because they're driving towards the valley of the ashes. But of course, what's actually happening is it is, it is, a, it is a metaphor, it's symbolic foreshadowing of what is about to happen to poor, poor Myrtle. Right, we're going to pause there because that's quite enough from me. It's not the end, though. So please do tune back in. Uh, one for the reading of the second half of this chapter and then also this accompanying analysis. If you haven't subscribed, oh, please do so, because then you'll know exactly when this video is ready. Um, and feel free to pop onto my channel, have a look at the playlists and see what is there to help you with your study of English literature and language. That's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. Happy revising!